Okay, so welcome everyone. And I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement for, for Memorial University. We respectfully acknowledge that Memorial University is located on the ancestral homelands of the Beothic people and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Nyingmaa and Beothic. We'd also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatukavut and the Innu of Nitisinan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. So, as I just mentioned, uh, my name is Ingrid Mary Percy, and I'm an associate professor in the visual arts program in the School of Fine Arts at Grenfell Campus Memorial University. Um, our guest today is Newfoundland and Labrador artist Pam Hall, who's joining us from St. John's. This particular session today is made possible with a grant from Memorial's Public Engagement Accelerator Fund, which is uh, a fund that is organized by Memorial University's uh, Office of Public Engagement. So public engagement is, is quite fundamental to Memorial University and basically it's, it's, just, it's just really, uh, you know, important to make sure I'm just letting some people in. It's important to make sure that, um, that we are engaged with the community and that the community is engaged with the university. Public engagement is a fundamental element of research and teaching activities to faculty, staff and students at Memorial University. They're responsible or sorry, they're responsive, collaborative, and respectful of the needs and contributions of the public, drawing on the knowledge and resources of everyone involved. Enriched by the public's perspective and expertise, Memorial is ultimately a stronger institution, a hub of knowledge and ideas that serve the greater community. So, as I mentioned today, our visitor, our guest speaker is Pam Hall. And Pam Hall has had a 40 year career as a visual artist. Um, so today, instead of trying to talk about her entire practice and career as an artist, I actually asked Pam if she would focus on three bodies of work. So today she's going to talk about houseworks, seating, reseating, and the encyclopedia of local knowledge. So Pam's going to give a talk for about 50 minutes and then we'll do a Q&A session at which time you can type into the chat your questions. And that will be the format for today. As I mentioned, if you're still logging on, which there are people coming in still, um, please feel free to turn off your camera because this is being recorded today. So a little bit about Pam. Pam is an interdisciplinary artist and a scholar whose work has been exhibited across Canada and internationally and is represented in many corporate, private and public collections, including the National Gallery of Canada. Pam's practice is interdisciplinary and often focuses on notions of the body, female labor, placemaking, the nature of knowledge and notions of the local. Pam was the first artist in residence in the Faculty of Medicine at Memorial University and their inaugural public engagement postdoctoral fellow. She was also the creator of the multi year, multi chapter art and knowledge project towards an encyclopedia of local knowledge. She has lived and worked in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador since 1973 and graduated with an interdisciplinary PhD from Memorial University of Newfoundland in 2013. And if you haven't checked out Pam's website uh, previously, you might want to do that after today's talk or during it. Uh, Pam's website is pamhall.ca. So thank you, Pam, and welcome. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. hundred yes, um, percent. So pleased uh, to be with you all. I watched some of you sign in 
So I know I have friends out there on the other side of this screen. Um, but uh, I am coming to you from St. John's, which is, as, as Ingrid pointed out, the ancestral lands of the uh, Beothuk and, and the Mi'kmaq, and only a stone's throw from the lands of the original peoples of Labrador, of the Inuit and the Innu, and all their ancestors and relations. And I thank them especially for welcoming me as a visitor on this land where I have stepped as gently as I possibly can to make work for almost 40 years. I'm pressing my slide thing and it is not advancing. So let's. There you go. We still good there, Ingrid? It's working. All right. So, and to the MFA program at Grenfell Campus at Memorial. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today and to share these three projects from this uh, practice, which has been underway for an extremely long time. <laughs> it's been, as you say, an interdisciplinary practice that over many years has moved from object to objective, from product to process, from the solitary to the collaborative and back again and back again, a practice that has moved from studio to site to situation from noun to verb, if you like. And so, yes, it is an iterative, interconnected, interdisciplinary practice. And it almost always circles around, um, much to my own consternation sometimes, a single question or impulse for many years at a time. I don't do small projects. <laughs> and so it is a practice that, yes, over these 40 years is made up of many, many long, long stories and many of which are still unfolding. Certainly the three projects I've been asked to speak to you today are like that. They're big, they're unwieldy, and um, they are uh, in some ways still unfolding, but have unfolded over many years. And in this image across the top, you can see evidence from Reseeding the Dream East, uh, which is a project I'll talk about across the middle. You can see evidence of um, the, some of the work out of Houseworks, and across the bottom, you can see excerpts from chapter one and two of the Encyclopedia of Local Knowledge. Um, I'm not going to speak in order. This is not work that sits in a nice linear trajectory. So here is, is Houseworks, um, which in this iteration was mounted at the Rooms uh, Provincial Art Gallery in St. John's for the summer of 2014. It was a survey exhibition representing 10 years of collaborative uh, practice and the solitary research practice from which it emerged. It was about or preoccupied with female labor, prayer, knowledge, and the building of place and community. Now, even though I have for a number of years considered most of my practice post-object in that the product is not the central goal, nor does it necessarily endure, you can certainly see from these images that I still make objects. Um, and this show uh, shared five big collaborative projects um, and four of them were personified in these large floating houses uh, that you can see on the left hand side of these images. And also, you know, there were 300 little tiny houses as well. Now, many of the objects in this show were made collaboratively, were constructed collaboratively sometimes in private, but sometimes in public performance. And down in the right-hand side of this picture, you will see a still from the durational public performance with two other artists, Lois Brown and Ann Troke, who helped me build the workhouse in a public performance at the room called, surprisingly enough, Building a Workhouse. Happened while the show was open and took uh, one a uh, session every day of four hours for 10 days. Um, it was one of a wide and wild range of collaborations in Houseworks. Uh, some, as I said, with more than 300 others from around the world who helped me make visible the little village you see, see in the upper right hand corner um, that I knit together uh, collaboratively via social media. It was a Facebook project, believe it or not. Um, and the other, on the left-hand side, the fourth of the large floating houses, 
um, was marginalia that um, produced this history house uh, that came from a daily practice of over four years with a single partner, Margaret Dragu, the performance artist in Vancouver. So these were the main bones of, of what can be referred to as, as houseworks. And it also contained uh, the seeds of these large collaborations, which lay usually in solitary projects. Because I still do undertake solitary projects. Most often they are in place, they are on site, they are on lands where I am a visitor um, who learned many years ago how to ask permission um, in my first land works in the 1980s. This is reseeding the dream east. It is an answering echo to the first reseeding project 20 years earlier, yes, 20 years earlier in Alberta. And the Alberta installation came five years after the Cod Moratorium in 1992 in Newfoundland. Now, for those of you in the audience who are not from Newfoundland or don't know much about its history, uh, the Cod Moratorium was uh, proclaimed by the federal government in 1992 and shut down almost all of the inshore cod fishery in this place. 30,000 people were thrown out of work and it's a long, very sad story. It still breaks my heart, um, but this project, Reseeding the Dream, um, was uh, emerged out of that uh, social, economic and cultural crisis in my place. This Port Rexton version uh, was commissioned by the inaugural Bonavista Biennale as I said 20 years later, to call the entire thing back to mind, not just the earlier project, but indeed the moratorium and the fact that the codfish have not in significant numbers returned. The 150 uh, codfish shaped wind socks that are flying in uh, reseeding the dream uh, were made over a single winter, probably six months uh, alone in my studio. Um, and they were made out of 150 old flower bags um, that I had been saving from the Alberta piece. They had been stored and waiting for 20 years to find their moment of most fruitful use. So there it is, some early seeds, labor and land and time passing, long processes and long effort. These are common elements to a lot of my work, as is the significant power of particular place to embrace, to enlighten, to enchant, to entangle, especially rural places, coastal places, places where folks are embedded and deeply engaged in their more than human worlds, which leads me to the third project I'm going to share with you today towards an encyclopedia of local knowledge which is called the elk, E-L-K for short, because it's a long title and it's a mouthful. Um, and it is now entering its 10th year of working deeply in place in uh, rural communities and in deep continuing collaboration with knowledge holders in multiple locations in Newfoundland. It was made by long periods in the field, listening, learning some better questions to ask, then listening some more. And in this project pictured here, which are elements of, uh, of the very first chapter, and this young collaborator, co-author is Shelby Simmons, and she is standing below a page entitled Who Lives Where in Conch, which actually lists and represents and labels every house and shed in the small community of Conch on, um, on the Northern Peninsula. And she did it with four other students from the all grade school. She was one of the young cartographers in this project and one of the first sets of local researchers that I corral into helping um, when I'm in communities trying to learn something. Um, so in the project here in the first time out on the Northern Peninsula in Bond Bay, I refined and developed a set of strategies for ethically engaging with others. Um, this was public engagement kind of before the Office of Public Engagement really got going. Um, but by the time they really got going and, and, and met this project, 
they were actually great and quite significant supporters of it. Um, and in, in some ways, this project is comprised of a lot of self-selected collaborators who uh, decided to help make something together that none of us uh, would be entirely able to make alone. So those are the three projects I'm going to tell you about tonight. Reseeding the Dream unfolded over 25 years. Houseworks represented 10 years, both of individual research and creation projects and collaborative practice that came out of them. And the elk, bless its heart, <laughs> approaching its 10 year mark as it moves towards white, what might indeed be its, its final chapter. Now, of course, in between all of this, in front of it and behind it and in between it, were years of practice of other projects that fed and fueled the ones I'm sharing with you today. There were works on the land and the water, works about fishing, about the female body, always emerging from a desire for direct muscular and material encounter with the world, as well as intellectual and conceptual um, encounter. I did not study fishing. I went fishing and learned to witness attentively and listen carefully. These kinds of preoccupations were also fueled by the specific and the particular, not just nature, capital N in quotation marks, but this particular field or the hunter's rock two miles outside of Whitless Bay or the big diesel, a particular fishing boat and a local crew and what they knew about their world. It was also fed by a growing desire to open sustained and engaged conversation with the world larger than the art gallery or the museum alone. Now, I don't mind the art gallery or the museum. I love them actually, and I hope I continue to show in them for many years to come. But I wanted to put contemporary art into locations beyond the white cube, outside the institutions where it was constructed within those particular histories. Um, I wanted to put it into locations where it would be accessible to folks that would never go to an art gallery, but who could engage in the work and the conversations it might open um, from their own confidence and um, positions of place. So all of these things uh, were in my head and underneath my work when I was invited to Alberta in 1997 by the Southern Alberta Art Gallery, uh, where I was in residence for, I think, I don't know, more than a month and a half, uh, and where the original flower bags were found by a really eager art gallery staff who located uh, 300 unused um, flower bags. And I bought them all. We used half of them in Alberta and half of them 20 years later here in Newfoundland. And working with local farm women, you know, doing workshops at the art gallery um, and to involve the community and working in some cases one on one. Um, we worked from a template that I had made to turn these flower bags into codfish shaped wind socks. And then I had to put mouths in them and harnesses on the mouths uh, so that they might fly. And about three weeks after I arrived in a farmer's field of winter wheat in southern Alberta, five years after the cod moratorium, dreaming of scarcity and abundance and the miracle of the bread and the fishes, I set the dream loose in the land of the Blackfoot people on the farm of Ike and Diana Lanier. And it was a dream of recovery, of resilience, and of the return of the wild fish. It flew there for more than nine months, right through the winter. And these photographs are taken by Diana Lanier, um, who documented it almost every day. Um, and I have to thank Ike and all his friends who actually went out in their pickup trucks and, and, and restrung the lines when they were broken by the wind. By the time I got back there nine months later, Ike had planted canola beneath the fish. So it, it moved from the metaphorical bread in the fishes of the wheat to fish and oil, uh, which was kind of what was happening, not just metaphorically here at home in Newfoundland. And uh, it was beautiful, that canola, uh, full of promise. 
and golden light. So, of course, I began to see not just the field, like that field, that beautiful field in southern Alberta, but the metaphorical field, the rural local, as filled with friends, with audience, with teachers, with collaborators, with partners. So I began to see it as a place to work, as a place to make work, and indeed, as a place to share work. Of course, art practice is not linear. And when I flew those fish over the wheat, I left and I came home to continue work that I was, I was doing before I started that residency. And um, my practice is one of kind of wayfinding. I follow my questions as, as many curators who have worked with my work will tell you. And I got home and there were questions that I had begun to follow um, that I continued to follow. That have a, a big influence on what eventually became the encyclopedia. I was working as an artist in an interdisciplinary study on the fisheries crisis in Canada. It was a conversation between scholars in many fields, fish biologists, sociologists, philosophers, you know, feminist theologians, historians. And uh, as the artist on the, on the team with a firsthand knowledge of fishing practice, um, they invited me to be a kind of full partner in the project and to make work to add to the scholarly textbook that they were producing out of this three years of study. So this is my chapter. It's, um, it's six works from, from conversations with fishers in Newfoundland and six works uh, from conversations with fishers in Haida Gwaii, the Queen Charlotte Islands in British Columbia. It is built from listening and learning um, from finding a way to uncover and reveal what they knew about their practice, their livelihood in that place. So th there it is all again, <laughs> the seeds of collaboration in and alongside communities. Uh, there is a special artist acknowledgement inside the published book that came out of this project that names all of my collaborators. Um, and um, there is kind of, you know, a, a bias towards practice um, and place-based knowledge uh, carried by those who work um, in the world um, of, of the wild places. Um, voices of fishers, uh, both indigenous from Haida Gwaii and settler from Newfoundland. And while I was at the med school, which Ingrid mentioned, that happened in the same year, 1997 was a big year for me, um, I was working with the, the voices and knowledge of med students, um, again, struggling to try and make visible uh, something more than my own creative expression. And at the same time, I was working with voices of women. And this in many ways brought me into challenging the way knowledge looks um, and how uh, we treat male knowledge and expertise in our kind of Eurocentric intellectual history for centuries through books and libraries and, you know, publications and footnotes and all of those formal occasions where knowledge sits. Um, so I made a, a gynopedia um, of women's knowledge of their body. I, I built a set of books that look very authoritative about uh, containing the voices of 200 women and girls that I did workshops with all over North America. So again, here are seeds of um, the multivocality uh, that sits in, in uh, the center, certainly of the encyclopedia, but also in terms of a lot of my work. Um, and, you know, my instinct is that, you know, many voices tend to be more interesting than one. Um, and all those voices need to be acknowledged. They need to be credited. They need to be cited. Um, and one needs to name the ones that you are sharing with. And it's in these projects that I began that uh, particular aspect of my collaborative practice, that, that naming of names. And so began another new decade of uh, five significant collaborations that emerged 10 years later uh, known as Houseworks. Um, and they began informed by these previous projects, um, but in some ways more intentionally. I was working very hard to try and understand 
how one might go about building the relationships that you need to collaborate with other people. Beginning with Marginalia, which was a four year collaboration with Margaret Dragu, who I mentioned before, and there she is, and me sitting in Grunt Gallery at the first performance Biennale there many years ago, which was their first time of presenting this work um, in public that went on for, as I said, four years. Uh, one of the curators um, uh, called this, uh, in the, the catalog for this is on my website, if you're interested, called this an archive of experience, um, which is not a bad description of the encyclopedia of local knowledge. Um, and it's also been described as encyclopedic many times. And that's what happens when you make something every single day for around four years. Uh, you know, it looks encyclopedic. So some of the fundamental strategies that I learned from Margaret and my collaboration with Margaret came from this four years um, on how to sustain collaboration and how to intentionally try and, and make a relationship with someone else. I learned a lot about friendship in this project. Um, I remember giving a talk at Goddard College where I, I used to teach uh, and, and being asked by one of my smart MFA students whether friendship could really be the subject matter for art. <laughs> and uh, I went, yep, I guess, you know, I mean, it, it, it was in many ways um, what this project was about. We both had to learn languages. Um, we each developed a daily practice uh, that involved making a little memory square or memory cloth and exchanging them and an email conversation. Um, so it has a long, long life of its own. It's very well documented on my website. Um, but it taught me how to work across distance um, uh, with the intention to make a connection, to build a relationship. And for me, that is a central impulse to uh, working collaboratively with other people, whether you're making art or making politics. Um, but also it engaged with a lot of subject matter that many people would dismiss as domestic or feminine, uh, just as many people, uh, you know, dismiss rural knowledge as old and dead and forgotten. Um, so our, the, the ground we covered in those four years were, was uh, all about place and daily life and cooking and the loss of our fisheries and the politics of mother's work and teacher's work and, you know, frustration with lovers and all that stuff. And in the process, we narrowed down to, you know, uh, a pretty amazing study um, or, or concentration on work, women's work, uh, female labor. And I remember the day I went to Bellevue Village to gather fabric to make a square for Margaret. and. Um, they used to charge a dollar at Value Village to buy a little waist apron, and they usually were made of really excellent fabric, you know, and I thought, well, you cut a, you cut apron strings up and I mean, that just speaks of women's work, right? So I bought this little orange apron and I brought it home and I had the scissors about to cut into it and I realized that between the orange and white squares checks on this gingham apron, there was a complex embroidered cross stitched pattern that ran about 12 inches tall and all across the whole skirt. Um, it was astonishing. It was at least 16 hours of work and I couldn't cut it up. Um, instead, I kind of said, wow, if I can see that, if I can see that female labor, just like that sitting there in a stitch, um, then I can, I can reveal it to somebody else. And that's when a new project called Dressing Up Work, The Apron Diaries began, which features, which inevitably led me to the second house in uh, Houseworks. Um, and uh, as always, I investigate things alone. First, I, I do my research. And in the case of The Apron Diaries, I took them out into the field, which is my favorite place to work and work with them on site in many uh, locations on the Bonavista Peninsula. Um, to see if, if, if alone, they would shout of the female work that um, I, I wanted them to. Here in this image on the left is a fish flake in Maberly and, and uh, 
on the right is the fish lake at Cape Bonavista. Um, both of them still standing. For those of you who, who don't know what a fish flake is, it is a piece of architecture designed to assist in the drying of salt fish after it has been suitably salted and brined. Um, and this was women's work and it is called making fish. And you can imagine how resonant that is with me and certainly has been a big part of my work in the past. So I went out and in, in, a, in a high wind, <laughs> tied 400 aprons onto fish flakes to see if, if they would do it, to see if they would uh, shout, this was a place where women worked, let's celebrate it. And I tied them around a house uh, to, to, to celebrate women doing housework and around a, a, a riddle fence garden to celebrate her gardening. And I did laundry and made paths to the berries and I did all this work alone on site uh, for one long fall season uh, and made myself ready to enter other locations of women's work and collaborate um, to make labor more visible than even these quite beautiful images do. They weren't quite strong enough for me. So I went and worked with others. In the first place, I did a long residency in a, in, in a food shop in downtown St. John's called Auntie Craze that was 30 years old. I interviewed everyone. I figured out what their female action verbs were, whether they were slice meat, weigh, measure, preserve, roast, clean up. And I counted the hours they had worked in this place since they arrived. And uh, uh, on the right hand side um, is kind of a, a it's a snippet, a detail of a piece of work called the Antichrist data map, which essentially adds up all of this counting. The loaves of bread, the kilos of flour, the hours of work, the numbers of cookies. And, you know, eventually comes out to somewhere over 1.3 million hours of female labor invested in this business over 30 years. Um, and the next year, I think I'm at 2008 by now, um, went and counted the hours of labor down at the fish processing plant in Arnold's Cove. Different kind of portrait, but again, counting things that count, you know, hours uh, of, of labor at the, at the fish plant, hours of unpaid work at home, age when you start working. Um, it seems silly and a, and a perhaps shallow play on words, but, you know, I think we have 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 built a culture where if you can't count it, it really doesn't count. Um, so here are those portraits. They are owned by Icewater Seafood. Um, they live in their lunchroom where there's the manager, Tom, um, finding about, about how, how many hours all his female employees have worked for him. Or here they are in an art gallery in British Columbia as part of the housework show. And uh, here they are at the rooms in 2014. And um, uh, the one thing you cannot see in this in this photograph is all of the names of the collaborating women, which are in vinyl on the wall to the right of, um, of these, uh, these portraits here. Um, and the the house again was made um, live over what totals one 40 hour work week. So three women, one 40 hour work week. This is what we made. So um, it's important to remember that if I'm going to name your name um, as, as a way to honor your collaboration and, and your help and your co authorship of this work, I do not do that without permission. Um, so Another piece of collaboration is the whole process of permissioning and I'll, I'll talk about that. So, okay, there's two houses from housework, the history house that came out of marginalia and the workhouse that came out of dressing up work. Um, there was a third house uh, in the, in the, in the show uh, called the prayer house and it emerged from, uh, from a process that started while I was still working with Margaret um, and was asked to make a work about prayer in Providence, Rhode Island. I was the uh, public engagement fellow for the Rhode Island School of Design um, and um, 
I went, well, yeah, I could maybe think of maybe something, maybe, um, and turned as I was in those days directly to marginalia. And on the left is a tiny little square that I made for Margaret with little knotted prayer rags that answered the, this, that finished the sentence, I wish for, or I pray for. And they are things like fresh fruit and vegetables, my mother's health, safety in the streets, enough to get by, et cetera. And in the process of trying to figure out what I might do in Providence, I did the, the project below this where I finished, I answered those questions on a prayer rag made of linen every day for 32 days and then made this small linen uh, house of prayer. Uh, these were, you know, materials mean a lot to visual artists and these were made on um, out of my father's linen handkerchiefs that I'd been holding, uh, holding on to since uh, since he passed. And, you know, Lois Brown reminds me that another element, both of this and, and um, certainly of marginalia and the workhouse is duration. And the fact that they do um, take a lot of time. And, uh, you know, that durational nature of this work is part of its uh, sweetness for me. You know, I mean, I spent six months sewing every day to end up with 150 fish and it was great. You get up in the morning and you know exactly what you're going to do. You're going to go in there and you're going to cut and iron and, and stitch. Anyway, so 32 days uh, 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 towards a house of prayer led me to understand that this could work easily as a public project. And um, it lived in an exhibition right across the hallway at Brown University from what we called the wishing wall, which was 30 feet by eight feet of fishing mesh that I had hired a fisherman uh, here in Newfoundland to make. And it started with a hundred prayers and there's a bunch of them up in the, in the left-hand corner um, because I didn't, I didn't want to just put an empty wall up there and expect local people to fill it. So I did a small project on social media called carrying prayers to Providence. And I mean, I couldn't resist. And uh, over a hundred folks finished that sentence for me and I inscribed them on cotton prayer rags and put them on that wall as soon as it was installed. And over the six weeks of its installation, it thickened, it quickened, its, its participants wrote their names down on the wall and um, uh, they were joined across town by a, a second wall at a high school arts program center called Urban Arts. Uh, they also put their, their names down. And near the end of the project, we took those prayers, we put them on the big wall and um, opened or closed the project with a multivocal community reading where uh, members I had met in the community during the six weeks that I was there um, read aloud um, together, overlapping voices rising and and falling um, the, um, the, the contents of those prayer rags. Um, and that's what led to the Newfoundland House of Prayer, <laughs> which was done in the same way, but with four walls. Uh, knit by the same fishermen and installed at sites in Corner Brook in the public library, in Stephenville in the public library, and at two locations in libraries and at a retail center in, uh, in downtown St. John's. Um, it was installed in 2014 in Houseworks, and you can see on the wall beside it the list of names of contributors. You can see that they're hefty, and uh, because that house kept growing all the way through the show. Um, people, uh, there were prayer rags kept on site and, and everybody who came into the show uh, added something. So um, that leaves us with the final house in Houseworks. Um, and actually it's the only one I made alone. And uh, because what's on the right of it was one of the most collaborative projects I've ever done the first chapter of the Encyclopedia of Local Knowledge. So when I made 
something to be in conversation with that. I took apart, you know, atlases and um, encyclopedias and sewed them all together um, to make this fourth and final house. So here we are. I know it's taking a long time. My timer's not working, so I have no idea how long I've been going. But I'm at the encyclopedia, so that's what I'm going to talk about. And before I talk about it, I'm going to introduce you to its main origin and source, even though you've seen already the seeds. Um, from which it has sprung, there is one small, small six panel body of work um, that 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 enabled me to imagine how the encyclopedia might work with writing and text and image and map. And these are two excerpts from that body of work um, and uh, represent uh, what i I learned um, and how I honored and was grateful to my main teacher when I was fishing from 1980 or 88 to 92. It's called uh, Things I Learned from Eli Tucker, the whole who was my skipper. And when he passed in 2004, I, I couldn't imagine ever making work about the fishery again. Uh, but by 2006 or seven, I found a way and uh, certainly these pages are what inspired and guided the encyclopedia of local knowledge, just as Eli inspired and guided my understanding of what knowledge is and uh, what it, it might be and who makes it. Um, so I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because I'd love to move into questions and answers. Um, certainly the encyclopedia is a project that works from the belief that art can work uh, towards and can achieve uh, more than aesthetic goals. It doesn't mean it abandons its aesthetic goals, but it means that it might have a social purpose um, that isn't social work. <laughs> um, so not only making meaning that matters, but maybe opening questions that need to be asked about who gets to make knowledge and who does not. So knowledge doesn't only live in knowers, it lives in places, in communities, in ecosystems, and social groupings. It lives in families and in tribes. And of course, it always lives in time surrounded and emerging from and in con constant conversation with multiple histories. Every time I go into a community, I begin to take notes um, and make photographs so I can make these kinds of maps. And they are called who knows what where maps. And literally they are like an index of everybody I phoned in every community and everyone I wanted to talk to and the people that I didn't get to interview so they are like a kind of community bibliography, if you like, um, so that you can see not just the individual knowledge holders, but the community within which they exist. So you can go, gee, she only talked to one guy who fished turbot. And, uh, and, um, and, and so you won't take the page on turbot quite as seriously as, as if you see that I actually talked to six guys who fish, fish turbot. So anyway, the elk is, is all about art and knowledge all about how we know and who knows and um, it's about skilled pra practice knowing ways expert doing making and being and it's in rural places so it gathers artisanal vernacular embodied enmeshed ways of inhabiting our common place that help us skillfully and sustainably live in a world where science is not the only form of knowledge at our disposal so it's a story about Work, the knowing that emerges from the labor of living in place together. And the first chapter, um, uh, there are 92 pages. They're made for months of field work in Bond Bay in the Great Northern Peninsula. They reveal an awful lot about um, stuff, but also a very little because it's the tip of the iceberg. So from panching a moose to, uh, you know, the difference between a punt and a rodney, from where the lobster are in Bond Bay to where and when you can, as I said, fish for turbot. Um, it's learned from fathers or uncles or aunties and grandmothers, and it's practiced almost until it's the hand that knows. Uh, many of my uh, partners in this project had to really think about how they did things um, because they no longer need to think the next knot before making it, you know? Uh, really, they needed to be asked to show uh, 
so that you could see how many steps there were because they weren't doing it step by step. They were doing it because they knew it in their body. And um, it's what many people call material thinking. Um, certainly it's a way of working uh, that is kind of integrated between your, your body and your brain. They can feel when the tension of the line is wrong or the tightness of the rod knot is wrong, or they can hear when there's something wrong with the sound of that engine, right? And they can make the change often a correction without even thinking. This is innovation. It is a shift to break from rules and habits, old patterns. So it's a kind of knowing that is nimble and experimental, even if it's emerging, um, sorry about that, from, um, uh, ways of doing things that look, quotation mark, traditional. Um, so gathered in person, in place, over months of field research, and each conversation with each knowledge holder began with an explanation of the project and ended with a signed permission form. Uh, the pages were then designed and returned as drafts to their communities. Uh, this is a revisit return piece of my process that uh, makes me feel more comfortable, that my collaborators are comfortable uh, in seeing and eventually correcting and revising and approving uh, what I have done with what they have taught me. Um, there are all kinds of art projects which are not um, uh, done ethically, um, and I don't want this to be one of them. So I work very hard to make sure that all of my co-authors are indeed self-selected and have given me permission, um, not just to use the material they shared with me, but to use it in this way, uh, looking like this. Um, in pursuit of that, I, I mounted six community exhibitions in 36 days uh, and sat in each one for three or four days, having conversations with people and with the work and watching the work have conversations with itself because everything talks to everything else. Old knowledge and crafts fade in some contexts, but reemerge in others, renewed and reclaimed. And community members are always bringing more to the conversation than they found there. They go in and they expect to see something and it's not there. So they're always adding something because rightfully knowledge calls to knowledge. And if you see a little bit, you want to add a little bit. So chapter one lives in the communities from which it emerged. It's now owned by public organizations in Conch, St. Anthony, Portishaw, Norris Point, Bird Cove. The university libraries have it. Um, the school board has it. There's excerpts on display in the Bond Bay Marine Station. Parks Canada, Lobster Point has it. And occasionally it gets shown in art galleries across Canada for the first time in houseworks at the room. So there's that circle closing, that first knowledge house. Um, again, take a breath, put up a show representing 10 years of practice, and then get to work on uh, chapter two, uh, which was, and I feel uh, it's appropriate to mention this, um, funded um, by the Public Engagement Postdoctoral Fellowship at Memorial University in partnership with Shorefast. Um, uh, someone asked me recently, why are you giving this to the library at Memorial University? Why don't you sell it? And, you know, in so many ways, Memorial University uh, is, a, is a founding supporter of this project. I mean, both through my PhD, um, which was fully funded and the postdoctoral fellowship, they bought me time in rural Newfoundland that no amount of ordinary arts grants ever would have supported. Um, so I'm very grateful to Memorial and uh, especially to, uh, to the Office of Public Engagement. So, of course, the second chapter started the same way, mapping, talking to people, thinking more about that process, trying to make it more visible, more transparent, um, and, um, and doing the listening and the learning uh, that, of course, finally led to, in this chapter, 75 pages, which just scratched the surface on Change Islands and Fogo Island. There are pages reveal the traditional species, where traditional species are found, how to, how to harvest them, uh, places where bake apples can grow, but not partridge berries, how to see the forward hook of a punt in a tree, how to pickle kohlrabi, 
can moose or hook mats. All of this knowledge is still in use. But often in some communities, it's undervalued and in danger of being forgotten. Though I must say on Fogo Island, they value their local knowledge deeply and with significant intention. So while in many ways the elk is working against forgetfulness, at its center, it's working to argue that we need more than a single way of knowing to move forward together sustainably in a world that is ever more flattened by a global monoculture and the ascendancy of, of Western science alone. So whether we're bottling caribou or, you know, pickling vegetables, whether we're trying to figure out what you need to know to build a punt, the conversation unfolds and the gathering proceeds. And um, on Fogo Island, I had local researchers helping me at workshops to gather berry knowledge. I had a community editorial committee which sent me to Island Harbor and said, you have to find someone there to include in this project. Um, and, uh, you know, um, eventually it came back in the revisit return uh, part of the process for review. And again, I did four or five shows in different communities on Fogo and Change Islands, but I confess that the show at the hockey arena was my favorite. And um, it's a profoundly important part of this process, uh, you know, permission, accountability, and transparency. I don't think you can work together without them. And uh, it takes time. It takes a lot of time and you have to give up a certain amount of control, certainly control that I was taught when I went to art school that that you've got to have. Um, so it exists like chapter one as a box, a beautiful box in a limited edition of 10 that uh, lives in small rural museums or fancy hotels. Um, it lives in university libraries. But after chapter two, it also existed as part of a dedicated website accessible to a much larger than local world designed by the way by Matthew Hollett a brilliant designer um, and uh, who made this website so engaging it was fabulous and it's searchable because uh, that's Zita Cobb's uh, credit um, she suggested there was no point in having it if you couldn't type in fish and get pages from all the chapters um, it's also now a hardcover coffee table book this beautiful blue book on the uh, right hand side, um, which again adds not just another layer, but another form, a form that invites an entirely new set of folks to encounter and engage with this work. Um, it, uh, it, the introduction in that volume, which I, I recommend you read if you, if you have the patience, I talk about excerpts and exclusions, and I name my attachment to incompleteness and explain it. Um, but when you do work like this, you have to be not just open to, but committed to um, uh, the idea of a partial perspective. Uh, the comprehensiveness is, is a myth and it damages a lot of people and a lot of cultures. So, the ideas that uh, um, fuel this project are uh, much more articulately uh, read or written in the introduction to that book. I should have read it before I wrote this talk. Um, but a few years later, I, I invited them uh, to, do, to do some work, these pages, uh, beyond themselves in a project called the Knowledge Exchange. Because when you make work and you put it into the world, it has a life. And the elk especially has has a very interesting one. It's uh, it's appeared in art magazines and academic textbooks and blah, 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 blah. Um, but at that Bonavista Biennale, it appeared here in an old schoolhouse in Keels as part of a community residency uh, where I lived in the community for, I don't know, a week or two weeks um, and spent every day in the front part of the building, which when we started had blank walls, blank maps on the table an empty recipe box um, and uh, lots of large questions and a diagram of uh, a seasonal round drawn on the wall. In the back room was the encyclopedia of local knowledge. People would come in and 
sometimes spend hours there looking at that stuff. And there was not a single person who came in there who left the encyclopedia and didn't add something to the local knowledge that had begun to gather in that front room. So there's lots of ways of gathering and revealing and sharing the local knowledge in your community. It doesn't need to be in a fancy art project. Um, and um, you could have a conversation circle and, and do some pretty interesting stuff. Um, so at that same Biennale, <laughs> another circle was closed. Um, that Bonavista Biennale uh, was the first, it was in 2017. And after they invited me to do the knowledge exchange, the curators came and said, we'd really like to do something outdoors. Do you have anything that you'd like to do outdoors? We know you do a lot of outdoor installation work. And I said, well, you know, as a matter of fact, I do <laughs> have something I've been wanting to do for uh, 20 years. And, um, you know, the, the, The challenge and, and um, brilliance of being able to close a circle that um, you had seen in your mind for so many years um, is, uh, is profound. And um, so 25 years after the moratorium and 20 years after Alberta, I got to uh, take those 150 flower bags that had been sitting in a trunk in my studio uh, for 20 years and um, close that circle. And it's strange to me how some circles take such a long time and call for exactly the right moment and the right place. And that certainly happened with receiving the dream East. And certainly the elk has its own circle. Um, and in 2018, it rolled open again when I found a partner and my old friend and colleague, Jerry Evans an artist of Mi'kmaq ancestry. And together, collaboratively, as equal creative partners, we laid our feet on a new path, a path that I could not travel as a white settler, but that I could travel in partnership with a Mi'kmaq friend and colleague. And that path took us to Miabukek, uh, the Mi'kmaq reserve in Con River, where we built relationships, we developed protocols, we got release forms, we raised the necessary funding. We established a community editorial committee. We gave them a list of possible pages that they added to and edited. We trained local youth researchers. We began and finished chapter three of the Elk, um, Miao Bukek, the Middle River. Now, Jerry and I don't talk about this work in depth without each other, um, but I've cleared with Jerry and he's fine with me showing you the draft work here. This was the work back in Con River without the translations. It was here for the review, revisit, revise trip. There was a book you can see on the table, a kind of Xerox copy of all the pages. So people could come in and find a mistake or an omission or the, a change and write it in the book um, rather than writing it all over the stuff on the wall so the next person couldn't see it. Um, that work stayed in the band council conference room there for, uh, you know, maybe a month and a half after Jerry and I left. Um, and we got some great feedback and we got asked to make an additional page by our committee, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually it went to translation and this is the fully finished translated work here in 2019 when it was delivered to its owners and first audience, uh, the people of Mubo Quick. Uh, it is permanently installed in their discovery center. So this third and maybe final chapter of the encyclopedia has 80 bilingual pages that remind us that local knowledge is not all white and it's not all in English. And they remind us that our province is filled not only with different ecosystems and bioregions, but also with different cultures and histories. And yes, if we can remember and reclaim them, different languages. The hard copies of chapter three live in Miabukek in the university libraries in Cornerbrook and St. John's. And they live on the Elk website as soft copies um, and are searchable there. They've been online ever since 2019 um, at that website, which is really easy to remember because it's essentially www.encyclopediaoflocalknowledge.com. Real catchy. 
Um, the uh, work was shown at Grenfell Gallery in the fall of 2019 um, and at Eastern Edge Gallery in St. John's in 2020. Uh, and the bilingual hardcover book in Mi'kmaq in English is due to be published in the fall of 2022. It is at the translators now. Excerpts from all three chapters are now apparently installed at the Queen Elizabeth Library on the St. John's campus of Memorial University in St. John's. And just a few days ago, I am proud to say the Middle River exhibition opened to the public at the Discovery Center in Woody Point, Gross Morn. Curated by Patricia Grattan and designed, I think brilliantly by Barb Daniel, this photo was taken for me yesterday by Dr. Ian Bomer. I have not seen this show yet, um, but already I am excited to uh, make the journey out there. And it will live there in, in the Parks Canada Discovery Center um, at least until uh, 2023. So that circle takes another long, another turn on this long, long project, which might after all finally be finished. Or not, who knows? I'm still interested in local knowledge. Um, this is uh, one of a quartet of works I made for the punt premise in Joe Bat's arm on Fogo Island in 2019. Roy Dwyer was my collaborator and we went out and caught the fish together before he cut it from my camera and helped me label all the edible bits. I'm so tired of trying to explain britches to people. And those flying fish there receding a newer dream that started in the paralysis of the pandemic in a practice of on making completely deconstructed stitch by stitch and then eventually made into a memory blanket that will carry i hope some of its own origin origins um, by uh, video projections um, like the one i showed you of those fish flying and those aprons all of those friggin aprons emblems of women's work uh, also being on made in the long still process of the pandemic. And then slowly hand stitch back together into a memory blanket, something to wrap yourself in, something moving, I think, towards shelter, towards warmth and towards sustenance. First steps on a new turn of the circle, taking time to see where and how these new simple solitary gestures might make a place for just my own small voice one more time. Thank you very much. I hope you have some questions. Thank you very, very much, Pam. That was incredible. I'm going to clap. Wow. Oh, I think you muted. See if I can unmute you. Sorry about that. There you go. I have two screens. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna unplug from this big screen. Totally. Oh, okay. We made it with no big technical glitches. Yeah, that was totally fantastic. Wow, amazing. What a project that the Encyclopedia of Local Knowledge. I mean, uh, that's astounding. That's an absolutely remarkable you know, kind of, I don't even know how to do it. I mean, that's it's an incredible project. It's just the yeah. amount of knowledge that you have captured with, with all of your collaborators is, is incredible. I, I mean, obviously I've been familiar with it for years, but to see it all together and to hear you talk about it is, is really incredible. I feel like there should almost be a, a Pam Hall research methodology. <laughs> I, well, I, in yeah. some ways there actually is and um you know i think uh this is this is something that some of your mfa students will be interested in i thought i knew how i was doing research before i went back to school in 2009 and um it wasn't learning anything in particular in phd school but it was thinking carefully and deeply about it for four years uh, that made me more confident 
in my research methodology, if you like, or methodologies or methods. And um, I think, I mean, I come, I'm old now. That's why it looks like a lot of work. And, um, you know, I was trained that we didn't need to think about this stuff. And, you know, we just needed to express ourselves. And, and you know, if we made work that had a purpose, then we were social workers and we weren't artists. And um, mostly my generation was told we couldn't really be artists anyway because we were women. And the minute we had babies, our intention would, uh, would flag. Um, so I think I've always been generally oppositional <laughs> in my positionality because I was told I couldn't. And so you develop a set of methodologies that kind of get you to a place where you're saying, oh, yeah, you know, watch me. <laughs> I'm going to and I'm going to find a way um, to do it. I mean, I still have lots of colleagues and there's still lots of curators around who I have terrific uh, respect for and affection for um, who, 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 who aren't really sure the encyclopedia is an art project. Hmm. You know, even when it goes into a into a into a public gallery, then they kind of relax a little bit. You know, they go, oh, well, OK, OK, contemporary. It's there. There was a curator. It's like it's the rooms or it's the you know, the tag or or whatever. And that makes them feel a little bit better. But when they, uh, you know, get out of the car at the Stag Harbor Visitor Center in Fogo Island and walk in looking for a cup of coffee in a bathroom and they see excerpts of it on the wall in cheap plastic frames, they go, I'm not sure that's art. Mm -hmm. I think the greatest privilege I have at my age now is I don't really care whether people think it's art or not. I care that it means something to people, that it mm -hmm. matters, that it makes a space for a conversation that might not have happened uh, otherwise. Wow, amazing. Um, so, there's some, I think there's some questions here in the chat. Um, or if, if anybody wants to turn on their microphone and, and ask a question, or if they want to type anything in the chat, um, does anybody have a question or a comment? Before Cindy Lancaster has a question. I saw it in the chat, but I didn't read it all. Sid? Turn your mic on. Yeah. Ask a question. Turn your mic on. I I was actually mostly mostly commenting, but I I, I over over the course of of the uh, uh, of your talk, which by the way is fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Pam. Yes. I have been following your work. I I first fell in love with your practice uh, when I saw the Apron Diaries many years ago. And I'm I'm totally gonna go fangirl on you. I have I love that. it never happens. I, I I have I have appreciated your work for for years now, and it has been consistently inspiring. So thank you so very much, and it has been an influence on my own current practice. So thank you. I really I I cannot thank you enough. Actually, um, I'm really interested in your your approach and your comments in terms of moving your practice outside of the white cube and outside of the institutional model and into into a model of of um true relationality on a number of levels and so more than actually a question about it i would just like you to elaborate further on that because that is something that i i find incredibly important um and the the longer i make work the more the more important that becomes as well so um absolutely i can i can certainly uh i can certainly speak to that a little bit i think it, and i remember when i taught it i taught for 16 years mfa students at goddard college in uh, their interdisciplinary mfa and i confess i see a few of them there tonight and I want to thank them for everything they taught me during that 16 years by asking me hard questions like that one. And I remember the first time I used the word strategy and strategic in an advising group at Goddard and everyone, that's such a military word, you know? <laughs> and I went, yeah, okay, well, maybe it's the wrong word, but it's a word to me that implies um, you are thinking um, 
in a context looking for opportunity. And um, I believe we need to be strategic, especially if we're women and we're working in weird, uh, you know, projects like I am. And um, one of the pieces of my own strategy has been to keep a balance between working in the white cube so people still think I'm an artist, you know, because if I never show in the gallery again, you know what they're going to say. You know, they're going to say, oh, 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 she's one of those community artists and she's just good for making murals or whatever that is. So you need to be strategic about um, where you do your work and what conversations you enter. And the reason <laughs> I want to stay inside the white cube and my students will tell you this, you need many different strategies for different discourses. And if I didn't want to have conversations about what contemporary art is, it, and I wouldn't need to be involved in that discourse. But I need to have those conversations and I want to have them because I, I have a, a thing or two to say about that. So I need yep. to stay inside that conversation in order to participate in it with any kind of authority or, or intelligence. So part of my own uh, strategic learning has been um, transforming um, the work I do outside the white cube, not into something I can put inside the white cube, but into something that steps so directly into conversation with its particular environment uh, that the guys in the white cube are going, oh, you know, and it sits it, mm -hmm. as a, as a, not as a nasty, muscular, excuse my French, fuck you kind of challenge. But as an example of something that actually, if it was in the white cube, everybody would go, yeah, yeah, that's definitely contemporary art. You know, and a good example of this is a, is a piece I did in Bonavista many, many years ago before anybody had Biennellis or thought about putting art in rural places. And it's called Fragments from the Inshore Archives and it's built on interviews with fishermen in Bonavista and it lives in the community museum in the Ryan premises in Bonavista and it will never leave that place. And mm -hmm. it has Eli Tucker's hand molded in it and his son Caleb's hand on a shelf, which says from the hand of the father to the hand of the son. And the, the greatest closure, the reason I get all weepy when I talk about receding the dream in Port Rexton is because one day in the field hanging those fish, a woman and a girl of about 13 years old came down into the field and it was Jan, who was Caleb Tucker's wife and Eli's youngest son and his daughter, i.e. Eli's granddaughter. And they were going up to Bonavista to see her granddad in that community museum. You know, so I didn't get a Canada Council grant to do that work. And so no curator ever wrote about it. Like for me, that moment with that girl and that conversation was transformative. And that's, Good. I mean, I'll get the next Canada Council grant. Maybe, maybe not. And the thing is, you have to be um, nimble is one of my favorite words now. <laughs> you have to be nimble. And, you know, people ask me, why did you go to PhD school at 57 years old? And I went because I had questions that I could only follow in there. You know, and, and, and they funded me. There is no way I could have made the encyclopedia without, without the PhD funding. Canada Council wouldn't have given me money for, you know, five months of field research in rural Newfoundland. You know what that costs? That's like $200 a day. So I got nimble and strategic. And also I love that kind of thing. You know, I love doing my PhD. And I loved doing the, the postdoc fellowship. And that's what got the second chapter done. So by the time I needed chapter three, I could write those grants, you know, yeah. and not just to the Canada Council, but to Shirk, which I was eligible to get funding from because uh, I am Dr. Hall. Right. And, um, you know, that's, I mean, it wasn't suffering, you know, for me, I, yeah. you know. I thought with a lot of great people. I see you, Sheila. Christine has a question here. Okay. Um, 
kind of following up on, on what I, I was, I actually really wasn't joking when I said the Pam Paul research methodology, because I mean, what you're doing is not easy. There's a lot of community engagement and public engagement, but there's a lot of really bad public oh, yeah. engagement and community engagement. And so what you're doing, it's very hard to negotiate that territory well and ethically. And a lot of, there's not a lot of pathways and you have like you have created these pathways that it would be amazing to kind of formalize that in some way and share that methodology so that others could, you know, continue doing what you're doing. Um, so to get to Christine's question, she says, can encyclopedia of knowledge methodology be made into curriculum? And by that, I mean, children, teens, locating their knowledge place as part of their curriculum. I can think of nothing more flexible for a spectrum of learners knowledge gatherers generators um i, I i'm just gonna do uh, uh two things i'm gonna plug my book and i'm going to uh i'm gonna give you um uh, uh, a story about that um because my whole idea is like i want this happening in every community in the world and i want them doing it themselves right so if you actually and everybody complains about the introduction to this book, right? It's not PhD writing, but it's not for grade seven kids either. It's dense, but it's in plain speech. And it, it completely outlines in detail the methodology of these two chapters. Um, and it's, it's easier than downloading my PhD dissertation, which is a lovely read, by the way, but not something you wanna to give to a grade seven teacher who wants a nice project for their kids. There were three grade six teachers in Cornerbrook um, and they, they had the encyclopedia because their school board person has a copy that they own and she was awesome. So their teachers went and said, okay, we're gonna pull all the fishing pages out of here. We're gonna pull all the food pages and we're gonna look at them. And then each one of us is gonna go and interview a member of our family. If you don't have anybody in the fishery in your family, do the food thing, right? So I don't know, 65 kids in Cornerbrook went and did this research and interviewed a family member, which is good because it's you're not cold calling a stranger. And then they spent two and a half hours on a live video conference with me in St. John's with the real artist talking about the power of images and the power of words and what happens if you put the word sideways as versus across the image and all that stuff. It was one of the most exciting three hour video conferences I've ever had. And um, those kids had a show, an exhibition of their encyclopedia pages in the Cornerbrook Town Hall. Mm -hmm. Now, there is an awesome curriculum project, right? And had Margaret, the school board person, um, taken good photographs of those, you know, paintings and drawings and collages the kids made, there would now be a children's encyclopedia of local knowledge, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which hopefully you guys will now go out and make, right? Or a consortium of school teachers will get together and make it, you know? I mean, this is, um, this is very uh, profoundly hard work to do, but also just wildly privileging. I mean, you know, I like sitting and, and listening to people tell me stuff you know, and tell me stories about that stuff and how they learned it. And I mean, I know it looks like a huge amount of work and it, and it is, but boy, it's been really wonderful. You know, I'm going back to Fogo Island in two weeks and you know, there's people in this project that are waiting for me to get there, mm. you know, and that's fabulous. It's an incredible, it's archive of knowledge that you have co-created not for people not just for people now but for generations to come you know mm. and that's incredible um if people ha have questions i'm now on the full grid here so you can either just say you have a question in the chat or just put up your hand i have a question oh. but i don't know how to get onto the video oh that's okay you can just is that pat gratton no this is ria banker Hello, Ria. Do you want, you can I, just ask it. 
I can ask Pam. Pam. Yeah. Pam. Oh my God. Talk, talk about a fan. I am the <laughs> hugest fan. You want a fan club? You want a president? Please call me. <laughs> I'm anyway. really just need a baseball cap with my name on okay. it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just fascinated with you. Your, what you say, and of course the work, you know, but where it's coming from is, is just over, overwhelming. But I have a question for you, you know, talking about bad community outreach. In the Arctic, you know, where I do a lot of my work, yeah. I see so much bad community work, you know, between artists and communities. It's just disrespectful. It's, you know, artists go and take, they don't give back. But uh, I find one of the, the biggest challenges is working with non-English speaking communities. You touched upon this. And oh, um, I'm just, you know, how do you work with translators? How do you keep the conversation genuine? You know, when there's something between you and the community, which is language. I mean, have you, how have you dealt with that? That is just a, a fabulous, fabulous question because, you know, we are the ruling white settlers of the goddamn universe, us white people. And we just assume that, you know, everybody can speak English. Let's just go ahead. And, you know, to slow something down by trying to find a translator and then you need a translator and it costs more money. So you need more funding and it's a friggin' nightmare. So it doesn't surprise me that a lot of people don't do it. Um, in Con River in Nyabukek, uh, no one speaks Mi'kmaq every day. There's a few people trying to get their language back. They had their language ripped out of their throats by the Catholic priests, and they've been teaching it in the schools, but there's no kind of conversational Mi'kmaq teachers uh, or, or speakers there. So even if we had been fluent in Mi'kmaq or had a, a, a translator with us, we wouldn't have been able to interview. In mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we interviewed in English, we proofread in English, we got our approvals in English, and then we hired translators and there wasn't a translator we could hire in, in our, our community in, in Mabukek. Mm. Um, but there were two uh, grown ups. One was the school teacher who was teaching Mi'kmaq in the school and the other was a helicopter pilot named Barry Joe, bless his heart. And um, they were both reclaiming their own ownership of their language. They were working, they were studying, they were doing all this stuff. So, uh, and this is one of the, I, I know people hate raising money. This is another strategic thing, you know, you want to do something weird. You have to have the money to do it. Right. And, uh, you know, when I raised the money for this project, I just saw myself as a funnel of like getting all this money from the federal government and moving it directly into Con River. So we hired Barry Joe and Angela Christmas as, um, something we made up, which we called apprentice, um, translators or translators in training and we paid them uh, a good fee same fee as the professional translator in nova scotia to do half the pages in the project each and they worked their butts off mm -hmm. now we we used the translated pages of the professional translator in nova scotia but we brought barry and angela along and paid them to do the work to get better at what they're doing wow and that's because I raised a lot of money. Yeah. So we got to pay for translation twice. Mm -hmm. So part of the challenge with community engagement or social practice or working, you know, where you need a lot of money um, is you need to not just be strategic. You need to be creative. Mm -hmm. You need to put some of your creative thinking, uh, brainstorming into, okay, how am I going to, we have a saying here in Newfoundland and I'm going to say it because I think I used the F word already. Um, and any of my students and colleagues from, from Goddard, hi, Beverly, hi, Kat. And, um, <clears throat> we'll know that I have a kind of potty mouth, but, um, we have a phrase that <laughs> is that praises rural people. Yay. Camera back on natives. Um, and that is, uh, he's really good boy. He's really handy. You know, 67 ways to put an arsehole into a cat. <laughs> and that is a compliment, mm -hmm. right? And I kind of pride myself on knowing about seven. And I think that um, part of that is I've learned from, you know, a lot of my teachers and a lot of my co-authors, you know, and um, the other thing is, is a trick that, that uh, I wouldn't have even named 
10 years ago. This happens as you get older, you get like right mellow and all that stuff. Um, I have learned to ask for help, <laughs> um, which is not an easy thing for uh, me uh, personally. And I find that when you do that, people will actually give you help. And if they see that what you really need um, is a translator, they will say, you know, it's not anything to do with art, but, you know, I know of this weird, obscure program over in, you know, unemployment or Canadian heritage or something that covers translations and no artist has ever applied for it before, but maybe, you know, yeah. um, so yeah, we have to find out. And in terms of working out of your own language, I will not do it. And I will not work with Indigenous people without an Indigenous partner. Right, right. I mean, the the SHRC guidelines and the Canada Council guidelines and the guidelines on Indigenous research in this country are extremely rigorous that Indigenous research is to be done by or with Indigenous people, right? Not to or for. Yes. So yes. you just don't do it. If I didn't have Jerry, I never would have gone there. Thank you so much, Pam. Thanks. I really Thanks, appreciate Rhea. It. And so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I love it when Facebook people enter the real life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beverly has a question. I think we'll do a couple more questions and then uh, wrap up. But Bev. Hi there, Pam. It's such a treat to see you. It's great to see and, you too. And, and um, my connection is not great, but I, I want to ask a question about. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you how you see your work now in relation, <clears throat> excuse me, in relation to the climate emergency, right. because so much of your work is about um, making the cultures and stories of these different and precious communities visible, and they are all um, threatened. We are Absolutely. all threatened by this climate emergency. So, um, so where do, where do you see yourself in relation to that issue, and your body of work in relation to that issue? Thanks. Um, yeah. Well, I see myself as um, on the uh, on the verge of uh, leaning into a new collaboration um, around those questions. Um, part of my trip out to Fogo uh, next month is to spend a little bit of time uh, talking with some of my old informants and my new ones um, about uh, some of the more than human consequences of climate change in, in those areas. Um, I, I'm artist in residence to a bizarre uh, multidisciplinary uh, uh, science study essentially called the oceans and coastal infrastructure, the future of oceans and coastal infrastructure. And in that context, for the next two years or three years, I'll be working um, kind of across all those uh, studies and which are almost all focused on uh, climate change and emergency, but within the context of the oceans. A lot of that work that's been done um, uh, has been mostly done uh, on, on, for land-based stuff. So um, I'm starting, I have no idea, um, but I do know that I'm beginning to find colleagues, um, both here at Memorial University, but also at uh, in Northern Norway, at uh, Tromsø, uh, where they work with Sami, and I've been invited to Norway next spring. So, um, because they too are concerned about their local knowledge. And um, I think I think the thing, my sense, Beverly, you know, and you know me well enough to know that I'm willing to talk out of the side of my mouth before I have any proof. Um, my sense is that this comes down to, uh, both for artists and scholars, how willing we are to embrace explicit and implicit values. Right? A lot of the knowledge I'm working, if you like, against the flat, global, progressive, empty, abstract spaces of modernism 
um, is is precisely seen as knowledge because it has no values. It has stepped away from affect. And um, it's interesting to me that in all of the binaries, the dualisms, you know, the nature, culture, you know, art, science, dualisms that you know, modernist intellectual history has given us, that the 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 underserved part of those binaries, binaries, the the female, the feminine, the natural, the um, emotional affect have started to rise up in the academy. I mean, you see it in gender studies, you see it in environmental and ecological studies, you see it in the arts and you, you go, okay, well, okay, so we're not gonna sit here and listen to this single track logic of reductionist extractivist science, you know, married and dancing with, you know, capitalist, neoliberal capitalism. So um, I'm just starting. Um, there, and I'm starting with um, uh, the folks I know in small communities and um, because they are reporting. They can't get wood in the winter anymore because there's not enough snow in the in the woods to go in on their on their skidoos and um, so I, I want to see what what they think, you know, how how they are willing to proceed. These are people who are entirely capable of picking up their house and moving it, you know, six blocks higher up the rocks. And um, so, yeah, but I'm, I'm with you and I'm scared to death. Thank you. But um, I love you. <laughs> um, I think Sheila has a question. Maybe this should be the last question just because we're, it's past 8.30, so. Sheila? Thanks. Thanks. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Pam. Pam, that's so beautiful. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, I, I actually wrote in the chart there uh, in the chat um, that I especially love the exploration of women's work. And of course, the hockey arena that made me smile ear to ear when I uh, saw that. I thought that was beautiful. Um, what my question is about collaborations and partnerships. Uh, because you've had extensive ones, certainly through these massive projects of yours, um, the wonders, the challenges, uh, because I, you know, I myself have certainly uh, uh, taken on partnerships. And I, I'm just curious about that, about how you deal with not only the, the local knowledge keepers, but also with partnering artists in these projects. You know, I was just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. And, and again, thank you so much. Love it. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Um, uh, collaboration is hard. Don't do it if you're not brave. And don't do it if you can't communicate. And don't do it with somebody who can't communicate or hear you. Um, I used to think you really needed like a written contract before you entered into a project with each other. I don't, I don't think that now. But I do think you need to sit down at the very beginning of the project and say, okay, who is gonna do what? Who is gonna make the decisions about timelines? Who is gonna write the grants, report on the grants? Who owns the intellectual property? So there's five questions right there. If you can get those five questions sorted, even if you have to do all those things yourself, if you're okay with that, then you're halfway down the road you know, to a kind of meaningful and productive and, and manageable collaboration. I think the challenge with collaborations with artists um, is that we're friggin' artists. And, you know, we have fairly big egos. Otherwise, we wouldn't dare to show our face, let alone take up space in a, in a fucking art gallery. Um, but we also have been taught, and hopefully you aren't being taught this, and hopefully some of uh, Beverly's grad students and my grad students at Goddard's were not taught this. But when I was in art school, I was taught that I am the center of the universe, that my creative expression is sacrosanct and sacred, and that everybody else is just the audience to my creative expression. So if you're raised with that kind of, you know, the genius, Renaissance, modernist, Jackson Pollock complex, whatever it is, it's your way or the highway, which means don't collaborate, don't do it. I think one of the most important things we can learn is to collaborate with people who know how to do it. And those people, and I bow to Lois Brown, who was in this room at one point, I bow to Robert Joy, who is in here somewhere, 
Um, but I have learned huge amounts from my friends in theater and performance practice. Margaret was a performance artist and a dancer. I'll tell you, she taught me a thing or two about collaboration. Um, and uh, I think that one of the things that is so wonderful about Newfoundland as a, as a community, a creative community, is that we have this non-specialization history. You know, uh, somebody at the Canada Council asked me one time when I was on a jury why so many Newfoundlanders were interdisciplinary. And I said, because they need help. You know, so they have to like do everything themselves. Or so, I mean, if I need a dancer in a project, I just pick up the phone. You know, it's not a large enough creative community to have, you know, kind of siloed itself into really, you know, shoulder checking, uh, possessive groups. And you can learn a huge amount about collaboration from people in performance, people in theater, whether you like performance or theater or not, people in dance. Be careful of dance because dance is still overwhelmed by that hierarchy of male choreographers writing on women's bodies, but new dance isn't, isn't so bad. And, um, and collaborate with people who aren't artists. You know, I mean, I, I learned a lot about collaboration when I was in the med school, you know, and I think, um, but it's hard. And I think one of the reasons I am so tired uh, right now, even though I know I don't seem tired for a woman my age with all the silver hair, um, is because I spent 10 years doing the encyclopedia project without a lot of solitary individual work in between. Like the great thing you can see in Houseworks is, okay, here's Pam collaborating. Oh, here's the research solitary stuff she did first. Oh, here's Pam collaborating again. The encyclopedia is just Pam collaborating. Except for reseeding the dream, which, you know, the BNLA curators gave me this huge gift by saying, come and make something of your own, you know? And um, so, and that's what I'm doing now. I'm healing from that 10 years of, you know, really putting it out. Um, and the pandemic has been wonderful for that, um, to give me that time and space to take apart all, all, all those things I had, had made before, you know, but it, it's a challenge. But if you can get some basic points clear at the beginning, you know, Jerry and I had a rule and, you know, I love Jerry Evans. He's like my brother and he loves me and we would kill for each other and neither of us would ever have done that project in Con River without each other. But we made each other cry all the time. You know, he would like say something mean to me about white people and, you know, I would say something to him about you're just being like a man, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, you have to build some kind of loving trust and that puts, you know, each of you uh, first and recognize that the project is not above you. The project is your relation and it will be however that relation unfolds, right? I hope that helps. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, if anybody wants to write anything in the chat, I'm going to save this chat and share it with Pam afterwards. So um, I just want to thank you one more time, Pam, for sharing your work with us. That was really, really amazing. And thanks everybody for coming today. Really. Well, I would like to thank it. Ingrid, if, if I could, just before, before we go, I would like to thank you for inviting me to do this. And I would like to thank everyone who came, especially this remarkable group of old friends and colleagues from across Canada and the United States. Um, I cannot tell you uh, how profoundly um, moved and grateful I am to mm -hmm. see your face, you know, Patrick, and to see your name, Bob Joy, and to see you, Christine, and, you know, Kat Muller, God damn it, why isn't your camera working? And um, there she is. Um, I see your child growing on Facebook every day and I still love you all. And um, so I am really grateful. This uh, feeds me um, more than uh, you can know. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you. If I was Buddhist, I would say namaste, but I'm not.
Thank you. Okay. Everybody. I'm out of here. Love you all. <laughs> Bye.